Are you an Amazon Prime member? Do you have five minutes? Then you could support us with five dollars a month for free. Head to escapeartists.net slash twitch for a complete walkthrough. Hey everyone, I'm Brent Lambert, guest editor for Escape Pod's Black Future Month special event. Submissions have been extended to the end of April and I'd love to see what you have. So if you had a new story you were wanting to start or you were close to finishing one, now is the time. Find all the details at escapepod.org. Looking forward to seeing your submissions. Escape Pod. Episode 781, Seed Vault, by Marai Car Bailey, Part 2 of 2. Welcome to Escape Pod, your weekly science fiction podcast. I'm Thivia, your host for this episode. Our story this week is Seed Vault by Marika Bailey. It was first published by Strange Horizons in November 2019. This episode is part two of two parts. Marika Bailey is an Afro-Caribbean author and illustrator living in Brooklyn. Your narrator this week is Eden Royce. Eden is a Geechee writer from South Carolina. Her short fiction can be found in various print and online publications, including FIA Literary Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction, The Year's Best Dark Fantasy and Horror, Apex Magazine, Strange Horizons, Lightspeed, and Podcastle. Her debut middle grade Southern Gothic novel, Root Magic, is out now from Walden Pond Press. Now, Get ready to hear tales from the griot of the future, because it's story time. Seed Vault by Marika Bailey. Narrated by Eden Royce. The desert rain has lulled me and I sleep all the way through the daylight hours. It is only when the light recedes and the temperature of the desolation plummets that I awaken. Min has gathered close to me, her large musky bulk keeping me warm. Around us, there are ice crystals on the gray earth, gilding the parched shrub grass. It does not get this cold in the village. Our air and earth are protected by the founding guardian line that rings every settlement. So we do not have the same extremes on the red as there is in the desolation. That last morning I left the house early, before Mama awoke. Sometimes it felt like she only ever slept when I did. Passing the small garden where Dasheen and Edo burst happily from rich soil, I went out to the borders of the red. Riding my Manaku Min, it was a few minutes from the house to where the staggered boundary of stone ancestors marked the end of the red and the beginning of the desolation. I'd heard that the larger settlements had multiple rings of boundaries, pushing back, back against the gray sands. But we were a young town and had just the one. Being out, I never wanted to turn back. It was the fire on the horizon that brought me out of my small room and smaller bed. The sands, gray, white, and black, flowed in an ombre dance as far as the eye could see, as tidal as the broken piebald seas. This time, I had a good 10 minutes watching the sand devils chase each other under the still rising sun before my Mipu chirped. I didn't need to look at the message to know what it was. Mama waited for me in the doorway, her face calm as she watched me slink back to the house. She did not move aside as I walked in. And though I am only a few inches taller than her, It felt like standing in the shadow of a sparker, a real desert-churning storm. She said nothing as I sat down at the kitchen table and ate the porridge she'd made. Didn't look my way when I packed up my stylus for classes. 
It was as I headed back through the sand-blasted lintel of our front door that she spoke for the first time that day. The only one you're going to hurt is yourself. Her face, known as well as the moons in the sky, fades to black until it is Papa's wizened grin. His mouth opens into a long cackle. I shake myself out of my sluggishness, shivering and cursing my numb fingers, and it is time for Min and I to walk again. I find the downed track car two hours later, stuck in a raw spinny, the air filled with magenta fire. There are places like these all over Tier, Jones says, where in most of Tier the failed terraform left behind wasteland. The raw were places where the earth had simply remained in flux. The land shifts away from your eyes. You find that where your feet land is not where you set them. Grasses change color and explode with multicolored spores that wing away like purple butterflies. Emerald Nanetti hoppers jump from grass to rock to tree, changing colors as they move, looking like colored paper floating on the wind. I leave Min a little back from the raw. When the wind shifts and blows in from the spinny, she sneezes and turns away. I pull the red bandana around my throat up to cover my nose and mouth and the broad leather hat on my head down, keeping the raw away from as much of my face as possible. Much good it may do me. I wade into the grass. It starts out low and stubby, and it thickens and grows tall past my waist the closer I get to the center. The sticky seeds pull at the cloth of my shirt and muffle the sound of my spurs. So it takes me a few minutes to find the bones. Good evening, I call out to them when I see their broken ivory peeking out from the red ground. It's a good thing I brought gloves with me. Some part of my brain had listened to Jones when they spoke. I put them on, but even through their tough manicou leather, the bones still feel hot like fire. I pull them out from the earth, two long thigh bones white as lightning. They hum and crackle. I place them gently in the grass and begin to dig and talk. Griot Jones taught me how to bury our dead. They showed up at my titi's door two days after the caravan of rescuers arrived in the storm-shrouded night. Tall and gangly, skin as dark brown as the carved stave they carried, walked me over to the gathering house, whose stones no longer smoked. But it burned in my mind's eye. Brighter than the sun almost, I raised my arm to block my eyes but I could feel the light. Jones held my hand as we walked into the charnel house dark and towards the bones of way back, hundreds of them. Come, they said. Our people need us. I knelt before one broken body, stomach and heart roiling, ready to bolt and throw up everything I'd ever even thought of eating. They held my shoulder firmly, feeling I was ready to run. I breathed in, and when I exhaled, I could see the gods' thousand faces, a mix of expectation and fury, and what I could only hope was love, ready for their children. I talked to the bones about all sorts of things. We are having good rains this spring, Elder. The red earth parts for me smoothly as if it has been waiting for me in the blade of my shovel, willing to be opened. The cacao are growing dark. The crop will be great this year, and we will have more than enough to trade for a new ansible. The cacao will rot in the fields when there is no one left to pick them. The ansible tower is gone. When I had made a hole wide enough and deep enough for the bones, I lower them in gently. The heat inside them pulses like the flow of blood, and it is all I can do not to drop them. I am your descendant. Please don't hurt me. As if that would be enough. As I cover the ancestor over with earth, I see their spirit rise up as a ribbon of light that spools around itself like golden thread. It floats among the divine colors of the gods who reach out for it, but it is the soul that chooses. The soul flutters gently 
over to a god I have no name for. His eyes are black pools that match his skin, and his hair is whiter than bone. He wears nothing but a veil of flowers. The soul moves to him, so close it looks as if it kisses the tip of his wide nose. The god gathers them in their arms, and in a burst of light, dives towards the waiting earth. The soul underneath my feet shudders and bucks. It ripples like a pond disturbed, and then like a boiling river. Underneath the movement, the earth changes. The soil is as red as in my home village. The grass is thick and green. This abundance flows out from the spot where I stand, a crashing wave of soul stuff and redemption. Where the raw was before, only a few yards wide in any direction, I can see it has begun its creep further. The land has a new foothold in the desolation. But my job here is not done. The car is waiting. This is an easy job. A kid could do it. My Mipu could run a prog on it practically on auto. But I do it the manual way for the practice. We used to try to crack the code wall around the Ansible Tower all the time, us kids. Hack a bot and replicate exponentially shifting patterns. That takes work. None of us ever beat John John the Ansible Man. But I come close sometimes, eh? Mama used to say she did not like it. That the law is for all of we. But who was the one who brought the glass chip to upgrade my Mipu, eh? My chest hurts the way the bones hurt like fire. Maybe I cry as I hack into the car's old board. Maybe not. No one here is going to tell you but the sand and the earth, and they are both mine. When I am done, I know where the car has been. The sound of the rustling grass is the sound of God's laughing. Soon come. The time in the spinney has gotten me turned around. I whistle to call over a bot to check the direction. These are not more than toys, really. Our major constructs. The work of the Ansible Tower was in the net that connected way back. And that is gone unless Auntie can fix the tower or find new engineers. I turn towards the path behind me, wondering if I should have stayed. The wind changes. My hair smells like smoke and blood. Gods will drive you with whips made of your own memories. It's been days since the craft was abandoned. On foot or pack beasts, they'll be slower. I can catch up with them if I push. I feel the shadow of Papa's gaze on me. The shadow where his eyes should be reveal a glint of white, like stars strung along an event horizon. If I don't push, I'll be driven. He laughs a sound like the wings of carrion birds slashing against the air. Three. Blood. Blood for the earth, blood for the tree, blood for the carrion birds, ri ri ri. Rock, sear grass. Eyes blinking shyly from under cover of leaf and mound. Claws pulsing, in out, to the beat of an unaware heart. Fire. Winds that propel shards of glass instead of water. The desolation, unforgiving but not empty, has its own rhythm, as much as the village did. I have slowly learned it, night after night. So it is with a sharp shock when I become aware that something has broken it. There is the sound of another person, not the rumble or tolling of God voice, but something so much smaller. A broken, sad voice calling out for help. I send the botnet out to track whatever was making the noise and follow them into the slowly rising horizon. A few minutes later, I kneel down in front of a broken body. They look up at me, eyes clouded with pain, and begin to cry. The yellow lady sits behind him, almost cradling his head in her lap, and her eyes fill with salt water. In the distance, I hear Urakan's drums echoing from a passing storm. The boy is skinny, but not light. I have to drag him up onto the litter I whack together out of some extra tent zipper stop 
and lash to the rings embedded in the back of Min's saddle. He screams when I lift him up, but then falls unconscious from the pain. Better for both of us. By the time I get us to some cover in the closest oasis, the sun is rising high into the sky, and I feel like I'm being baked into my kit. It's not much more than a rock overhang surrounded by a few struggling trees, but it feels like heaven when I can lay the boy down in shade and set myself and Min to rights. I don't have much more than the basic med kit with me, and nothing like this kit has probably ever seen before. I wipe the burns on his face and torso with calcol and follow up with a layer of bush honey and slap two of my algae gel packets on his chest. The jeep of poison in the gel acts as a stimulant, will pull him out of his shock. But there's not a damn thing I can do about his broken leg. He might live or not. I've done everything I can to tip his luck over onto the side of not dying. Knowing that Papa is following my every move. I stare and stare at this broken boy, maybe a few years younger than me, not a man full grown. He is skinny and has lost enough blood to turn his already pale skin the color of fish guts. You know who he is, Papa says. You know what he is. I do. How could I not? I wasn't in this soul-blasted desert for no reason. What did you come out here to do? Why do you think we followed you, girl? I never asked you to follow me, I spit back. Papa glares at me, a look that rips through my skin and heart and right down to my quivering guilt. You are here for the people, says he. None of the other gods have stayed for this, whispering off to wherever they go to when they aren't being amused by me. So no one is here to contradict him. And I'm not sure they even would. The threshold god is an eldest among elders. As I watch... A thin silver string of light rises up from the sleeping boy's chest. Long legs wraps it around one bone finger, drawing it up like thread against a spindle. But he does not snap the thread. Instead, he gets up and walks out of the shade and disappears like mist. I feed Min, eat something myself, and I can't keep my eyes off the boy. He doesn't die. He has freckles like Miss Oberville, who made nut cakes every gathering day, her grandmère's recipe. I'd seen her soul rise from the burned ground where she died, and now this boy. I am fighting with myself, fitting, seeing as how this all began with a long-ass fight. Is we is or is we ain't, people. At first, this was not much of a fight. The other people, after all, stole us. Not much talking there. But afterwards, after the first war for we, the question was asked. It kept being asked. A thousand years later, we came to Thiers, and that, we said, was that. We wanted, at long last, to be left alone. And we couldn't even have that, could we? The gray dogs arrived. That is what we call you. I say to the boy who cannot hear me, because I am mad in all permutations of the word. He's sleeping. His bleeding has stopped and he is breathing. Good signs. But he is still pale as fish guts. The freckles across his face stand out in stark relief. I know nothing about him or his people. It is not so much that the people hate them, it is that we see in them another link in the chains that were made for us. So we mostly stay away except for some small trade. There are talks of outside mediation, mother's blood. The hollow vids don't say much about them, the odd short documentary. But I know more about the foxes that hide in the desert oases than I do about this other human being. Who are their gods? Do they even have them? I don't know. We are not taught much about the gray. They live far to the west of our settlements. Habitations cum townships they call Nuom 
thrown up around the spot of their landing two decades ago. Pretty shit showing for it. I can see his bones nearly as well as I can see death's. His eyes open and he's staring right back at me. Weak as shit tea, but nerve enough to look me dead ass in the eye. Are you going to kill me? He asks in garbled emigre. Probably not, I offer. He nods, although he must be working hard to understand me. It has been some time for us people, and languages evolve almost as quickly as hatreds. Where are your little friends? His eyes narrow, like the sound before a lie. Trade, he asks. I laugh. You're dying, Mioj, but sure. How did you do it, he asks, licking his cracked and bloody lips. How did you make the earth do what you want? What? You fix the ground. How? The earth around New Ulm, their patch of Tierre, will be as gray dust and barren to them as the surface of an asteroid. They are not us, and I have confirmation of what I have feared all along, in the spirits I did not see rise out of the grave of the gathering house. You people really are evil as well as greedy. My sister died because we didn't have enough food for her, he says around fresh tears. My mother cried herself to death. Do you have a mother? Rage brings me nose to nose with him, this audacious child. I did have a mother. You killed her. The hand of his gods must close his throat for him. Blessed be their mercy. The boy chokes on his tears and turns away. Eventually he falls back into sleep. When he wakes up, I will have questions for him. They said we was only going to trade. I can hear the boys whine as I trudge further into the desert and close, so close to my quarry. Who goes to trade with twelve men, armed with near obsolete starship cutters? Who goes to trade with empty pockets and sacks? Who goes to trade and come back with bloody butcher's knives? These men, once twelve, now five, did. Six lay their own bloody bones in way back, and one is a boy wounded and feverish on the edge of his own death, but left behind all the same. I have come for the others, and the ragged bags they carry behind them. The bags look like ag surplus. Normally, strong enough to haul anything you want, but this cargo didn't want to be carried. They're down their car, and half their friends, and now it seems they're about to lose one of the pack animals they brought from off-world when they landed. Well, I assume that's what they're yelling at each other about. The big, long-necked plotter is lying on the ground, stunned. It's hard as stopping, poor thing. I didn't give them a chance to do more than yell. They dropped as surely as the pack beast, electric charges leaping from the swirling drones surrounding us all, herding them in a close circle with me at the center. They cursed and spat and vomited on the sandstorm rippled ground, and I stared them down, tired and wasted as the boy, eyes dark with surprise or hate or confusion. As if it mattered to me. One stayed conscious long enough to spit at me. Fucking animals. He fumbled for the blast gun across his chest. Even got it aimed up at me before it too sparked and died. Thierre eats up off-world tech, and then off-world blood and bone. They must have found an old sealed stash from landing decided to come to our side of the desolation to take what they wanted. I walk past the stupid man still scrabbling for something, anything to stop me with. Their hall sacks have spilled out into the dust, ripped open by their fall or by providence. What was inside is bloody red and bone white against the sand and pulsing like a lighthouse. Mon familie. A click behind me makes me turn, the last man is standing, teeth gritted and bloody, but standing still. Drones must have been low on juice, or maybe he has a heart like a sand courser. Point is, he has the barrel of a gun pointed straight at me. It's quivering, but his voice is steady enough when he asks me. 
Why are you fucking people so hard to kill? In the rising storm, I hear the sound of clinking bones in the wind. It shouldn't have taken so many of us to take one stupid village. There is blood dripping from his mouth, but that gun is steady, steady. We're at landing fucking starving, and you freaks are just sitting pretty. No real walls, no army, but you got food, and you got land that doesn't fucking turn everything to dust. Doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem right. You in trouble, baby girl? We paid good money to come here, and the fucking planet is half dead. He cocks one wild eye at me, as if I personally salted the planet in anticipation of him and his. Except what you got. Somehow you got all the good stuff. I see. And you know how. He laughs, manic, full of teeth and pain. Oh yes, got one of your traveling men, he told us. Squealed. Yeah, this boy a few rows short of a field. I ignore my God. I only see the gun can only see the gun. I've seen it almost every day of my life, sitting on my mama's hip, a layman's piece, coated to her hand. It can only be shot by her. He has my mama's gun. So. I slash my knife down the length of my arm and pull myself into the pulse of bones spilling behind me as my blood rushes to meet them. Reality breaks open as the ground shudders up and swallows us all. Gods are memory. Blood is memory. The earth remembers all. I am Thierre and myself. We are the restless chain of gods and the robbers of bones. Us, I, they, we, witness the end of the world. Death comes from without hovering above. Five grams of heterotrichloridophane sulfitamate injected into a self-replicating carbon-nitrogen matrix. We learn the formula in sixth form. The matrix is placed within a caged hydrogen reaction and encapsulated in a thin film of imaginary numbers and dropped into my atmosphere. It burns. It burns worse than anything I, we, they have ever felt. In real space, it is the size of a child's fist. In the plane of history, it is a long chain dangling back into the irrigated lanes of abandoned forest left bare by plague. It is a harbinger of ships with white masts at the horizon. It is the weight of a boot and the sharp shank of a bayonet into flesh. This is the first half. I know, I know what comes next. Please, please, no. Let me go, let me go. What is this strange intruder? This is no rock and ice traveler to break apart in my air and kiss my surface. What is this? Terraforming. Copyrighted by the Ang Bar and Weiss Multigalactic Corporation, 200 Earth Standard Years. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. A crimson pearl wrapped in a shimmering call of fire that separates its dimensions from ours and from every living thing it touches until the reaction at its core runs itself dry. It pierces through the lower atmosphere, where it explodes. Your world, your way. We build a better planet, the quicker planet, fixer-upper. It wasn't supposed to be like this. From the ground, the world ends with a slash a stab, a shiv. The capsule was preceded some days ago by a sonic drill. Alloy, organic material, nothing, nothing to, to, to worry about. It is a machine, now mass-produced by a subsidiary of the Deer Company, around the size of a tall human. It is heavy, core heavy, which is perfectly fine, as it is meant to go down. I said stop! I want to get... As the red pearl sizzles and burns its way through air, the drill begins to dig. It is a broken bone, rotting teeth shattered at the gum, bloody pain. What are you doing? 
It is in me, in me, in me, in me. There is within and without. How has this gotten here? Core belly fire, heart soul stuff star sparked. Kill it, kill it with everything until the pain stops. No. It is here that the drill turns into a bomb, letting off a combination thermal and electromagnetic pulse that disrupts the magnetic field of the planet. Fuck. The planes of the earth buckle up, releasing fire. The pearl touches earth. Its thin veil of containment shimmers and disappears, and it too explodes. Like the spores of a ripe fungus, the air is seeded with millions of matrices, painting the sky pink, as if with millions of flowers. The air is bent with thunder and it begins to rain a mixture so toxic that it rearranges the very strands of matter it touches. And Eden, 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 Eden for, for everyone. This process is called endometrial geodestabilization. The earth sheds its deepest skin and is reformed according to the designer's instructions. That is what had always happened before. No, 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 never. This time, the earth fought back, and when we, the people, arrived in our sleep ships, it was to a geological toxic waste disaster. The soul of the planet was dying, and with it the soul and the air and the water. And soon after, we died too with our lungs clogged by gray ash and desert sand and bellies hungry and empty as the space where the Earth's center used to be. But you know what happened next, little thief, little sneak. Someone has told you, or perhaps you persuaded them in your gray doggish ways, eh? Do you have their bones too? There was someone. At first I could not hear But she called me over and over, and oh, the voice was many voices. And I had never heard such a thing in all my dreamings. Grandmother Latasha, may her memory last as long as the people. The engineer of souls. Bridge the gap at the heart of the world with the ropes of our DNA. Adaptation, translation, billions of constructs rewriting our base code. Blood and bone. Where you sleep, I will sleep. Where you go, I will go. Whatever you become, I will become with you. You promised! Where we were buried, where our blood falls and is consecrated, Tierra is reborn. You will not steal us. The morning the gray dogs came to way back to raid, I was already out of the house, farther than I'd ever gone before staring at a horizon that I thought was my only hope for a future. I spent most of my days, it seemed, being eaten up by a fox named Far From Here. So I left the little house, as far as I could get, to get a little touch of what I fiended for. So I wasn't where Mama expected me to be. She couldn't find me at all. I tried to be a good girl and could not. She tried to find me and died. I look up at the souls released around me and think, Me too. Please, take me too. I feel myself begin to unspool from the spindle of my bones, unraveling towards the light like Mama. Something tugs me, pulls me back to my body, shivering, to stare as the spirits of my people are given to the earth by their gods. Until I am surrounded by silence and new fertile earth, and completely alone, again with my dead. Girl, is that why you thought we came with you? To send your soul to the earth? I thought you were mad at me. I pull up my specks, pawing away tears that fog up the glass and blur the night. When I manage to look up at long legs, he is grinning at me. That is the joy of being a parent to do. An infinite capacity to be angry and love you at the same time. 4. Seed I send the boy back to New Ulm on the surviving plotter. After the new earth rose, there was one left, happily chewing the crisp newborn prairie grass. He was quiet, looking me over still too skinny and too pale. 
huddled under an extra saddle blanket. What are you all going to do, he asked. I knew he was talking about the people and what his friends had done to us. His face was pinched with worry. I adjusted the buckles on his saddlebags. No use me sending him out into the desert to die after fixing him up. But it was a good question. What would your people do if it had been us come killing? I asked back. He turned away as was his habit. I finished loading up the pack beast. I set a drone to roll along with it as a guide until it was near enough to home to make it the rest of the way itself. As the beast began its plot away, the kid turned back at me, face shaded by the cloth wrapped around his head to keep out the sand and dust. I'm sorry, he yells from the back of the beast, not quite strong enough to find me eyes when he says it. I watched him leave, then saddled up Min to go in the opposite direction, back home. The moon rises higher in the sky, lengthening our shadows across the sand. Mine, Min's, and Papa Bones. You going the right way, baby girl? I hope so. And that's our story. Marika Bailey grew up in a family of science fiction nerds. In fact, her uncles used to call her by a nickname that's a Star Trek pun. But science fiction has rarely ever reflected that love back by showing a far future that included blackness. This story is a love letter to her Trekkie family and also a question as a descendant of the African diaspora. How can a colonized people and a colonized land help each other heal. There's an interesting difference of opinion that's beginning to develop among fans of space exploration. Some subscribe to the old dream of colonization, a word that no longer has quite the shine that it used to, and they feel that the universe exists for our taking, that it's humankind's right to take the natural resources available on asteroids, the moon, other planets, and use them to further ourselves. But another part a smaller part at the moment, is calling foul on this dream. They want to explore space without following our previous pattern on Earth. For some, colonization is a dirty word, and to apply it to our future doesn't always sit well. If we do go about settling ourselves on other planets, should we transform them into a human paradise? Or should we search until we find a suitable home? What I love about this story is that it takes both halves of that argument, turns them into a fiery ball of hell, and then finds a way to quench the flames while also providing some solace to the people here on Earth who felt the burn. I also love the sneaky way that the story starts out feeling like a fantasy, something set in the past with ghosts and magic. As with last year's novella, The Sun from Both Sides, this one turns those expectations on their heads. It transports us from ancient times to a highly advanced future, and in doing so, it brings together the past, present, and future, and spins a tale that would, I imagine, make a griot proud. Escape Pod is a production of Escape Artists, Inc., and is brought to you with a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Don't change it. Don't sell it. Please do go forth and share it. If you'd like to support the pod, please rate or review us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. We are 100% audience supported, and we count on your donations to keep the lights on and the servers humming. You can donate via patreon.com by searching for Escape Artists, or via PayPal through our website, escapepod.org. Patreon subscribers have access to exclusive merchandise and can be automatically added to our Discord where you can chat with other fans as well as our staff members. Our opening and closing music is by Daikaiju at D-A-I-K-A-I-J-U dot O-R-G. And our closing quotation this week is from physicist Freeman Dyson, who said, The ultimate purpose of space travel is to bring to humanity not only scientific discoveries, 
and an occasional spectacular show on television, but a real expansion of our spirit. Thanks for joining us and enjoy your adventures through time and space.